Good Monday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast with Jesse Summit and Austin Price and Rob Lewis. Brent Hubbs, glad to have you along with us on this Monday. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Tennessee with their first major scrimmage of the preseason. Uh, notes on the board, kind of a recap, collaboration stuff that Jesse put together. From all you guys, scrimmage one, what's your, what's your initial, not individual, what's your initial overall takeaway from, from everybody you've talked to? Because we'll get into individuals in a minute, but give me a takeaway. Oh, I mean, kind of the sentiment that I think some of the assistants iterated uh, when we met with them, and then Jeremy said the same thing, the, the fact that some guys are going to be more up to speed defensively because this is year two in the system. Now, I know some it was some freshmen that made some plays as well, but I think just overall there's a comfort there uh, where guys are kind of being able to more read and react instead of kind of thinking and then trying to make a play. Well, to me it's just the what you exactly want to happen. You want a nice blend – of vets like Callaway, DWA, making plays with some of those younger guys that you, 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 I won't say you had to have, but you were hoping would emerge. Guys like Henry, guys like, you know, Crouch making plays, even against the twos, just seeing him kind of do some things from a, a new position. And then, of course, Eric Gray. I mean, every since they put on the pads, I mean, it's one thing to say you were, you know, elusive and two hand touch, but when you're out there and you're, you're missing live bullets flying at you, I, I think that speaks volumes. So to me, it's just a, it's kind of the the mesh, the blend of old guys and new guys that you know to me that makes up the chance for this you know team to take a step in the right direction. Yeah, I mean for me, it's I mean the, this the buzz that there was some good things from the defensive line. Now the downside of that is some of that buzz was created by Aubrey Solomon, <laughs> who's you know still out there in NCAA limbo. But I mean it's for for a, a part of the. You know, the defense is such a huge question mark. The fact that they, you know, there's the, any kind of positive percolated about them coming out of the scrimmage, I think, was a, was a good thing. And I, I do think, you know, it, it's interesting that, you know, the buzz coming well, Solomon, Emerson had a sack, Middleton, I think they're still trying to challenge him, you know, power and strength wise, but his ability to just kind of swallow up space has intrigued some folks. I mean, those are the three that got the initial reps for the one, you know. None of those guys were playing a year ago yeah. <laughs> for Tennessee, which right. is just, you know. So it's it's funny because I say that like, you know, the the, the feedback from, from from folks was that guys, you know, were playing faster because year two in the system. Well, other than Emerson, he was the only one that was here a year ago. So it's just that, that there's, as Austin said, it's a it's a blend of things there. And do you read anything into the fact that they, <clears throat> excuse me, let Solomon run with the ones? I mean, is that just? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that yesterday you're playing ones versus you're putting your best versus your best out there, and you just it's you still you're not in the I mean, game plan. So you go ahead and you're hoping somebody that I, I talked to somebody earlier this or over the weekend who, you know, this is a game of telephone third hand type deal that 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 Philip Fulmer said in Memphis to some people when asked about it. They were he was out there speaking at the Memphis Scholars deal with Rick Barnes and, and the new chancellor, and they. You know, did a little meet and greet, hobnob with some some people of note out there, and he was asked about it there, and he said that he told somebody he said, "Listen, I'm calling the NCAA twice a week, and I get some days I get a positive feedback, meaning we're going to get some news pretty quick, and then the next day I get something that's not the most positive in terms of a timeline or whatever." So, I don't think Tennessee has any idea of when that's coming. I think they're just going off the hope that it's going to happen. I, I if they if they don't hear anything on Solomon this week. I think then it gets interesting to see where he is in the rotation for the second scrimmage as they get closer to game time. Because if you don't know anything by the end of this week, then you really do have to look at it from the standpoint of, okay, we're not going to have him. And you got to start. You got to start preparing to not have him and work your rotation that way. At least I think you have to. Th- I, I think know. That I, way. I think I, I'm, I'm in wholesale agreement with there because they're. The, the last the last scrimmage won't really be a scrimmage. It's going to be like that walkthrough where it's just all about the organizational stuff of where guys are in the booth and it's on the sidelines and that kind of stuff. So the the reps are going to start. You know, I know it may be that Jeremy may say that everyone gets the same amount of reps in practice, but that's not the way it works in a scrimmage. Well, but no, because you got to get ready to play. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's it's time to move forward with the game. I think it's interesting on Middleton too. Is you know, I was talking to somebody. We all you know work the phones and talk to people, as many people as we could, you know, Sunday night and, and this morning and everything but before we taped the podcast here. And, you know, I was talking about, you know, I told him, I said, you know, I've seen Darryl, you know, Darrell play and 
kind of know the history, so maybe I'm a little biased or a little jaded from the fact that I know he's been resistant to play, you know, inside, play the positions. He fought getting bigger and everything else. And, you know, where's he at from a physical standpoint? And I said, look, he's just big. And, and you can't coach big. And the point it made to me was like, you know, his first couple of years at Tennessee, Albert Hainsworth played. Nobody considered him a great dominant player. Now he had a really good third year when it was a contract year, but it's like, He's just big, and that's what Jesse, you're saying. He just swallows up and takes up space, which is why there's, you know, they want more out of him, but they're going to take whatever they get just because he's big. He's so much bigger than some of these I mean, other guys out there. Physically, to me, he's the most intriguing prospect on the team. I mean, as far as guys that we haven't seen play yet, I mean, he's just I mean, six, oh, he's, seven, three, ten. I mean, you can't. And looks fantastic. Yeah, uh, it looks fantastic. If, if you really could. If you could give him the aggression of a guy like Roman Harrison, I, I, I think he's like first round top talent. I mean, that's just when you look at the, you know, everything that he brings outside of just kind of being a little bit passive at times. Yeah. And I, I was told that he had some moments, but, you know, if you're playing, if you've got 10 snaps, they're not, there's not enough of them that are full speed all the time snaps. Yeah. And that's what they're trying to get to with him. It's not that there is some great disappointment. It's just, they're, they just see what you guys. They're trying to push him to get more. more. Yeah, they're just looking for more out of that. So, but with um, it, but but with, you know, and this is kind of tying it into Pruitt's own comments. What did he say on Saturday that you know sack of potatoes, sack of potatoes. <laughs> basically, they're all you know pretty much the same. You know, I mean that's the old Dooley, right? <laughs> right. You know what Dooley called him wrong? Yeah. Sack of potatoes. Sack, sack of potatoes. potatoes. <laughs> I mean, he he basically said you know all these ten guys are the same. Well, perhaps from a production standpoint, thus far in college, but. Middleton has an upside that Savion and Latrell Bumpus just simply don't yeah, have. He's, he's so, different. yeah, so if, if you're going to pick, you know, if you're going with, all right, there's two question marks here, you're going to lean on the guy that, you know, potentially, if you can tap into those 10 plays, could give you really okay. seven good ones. How intriguing is the Eric Gray stuff, given Austin, that we heard during the recruiting process, not just with Tennessee, but for a while with some other schools, you know, he's not big enough. You know, he's not big enough. Yet, there's no, there's no more, there's no more questions about how, he's, whether he's big enough, whether he's heavy enough, whether he's thick enough, strong enough, whatever. I, I think, I think it's he's infinitely bigger than Darren Sproles, and right. you know, that's the kind of guy sometimes you just need a guy that just can make people miss. I mean, like, you know, especially with this offensive line. I'm not saying they're not going to be better, but I mean, like, it's not like they're just going to go out there and just be, you know, mauling people either. So, I mean. I think that he's the kind of guy that can really be a, a difference maker, a guy that this team doesn't have, just because put his foot in the ground, change direction, not drop speed. And um, vision. And, I keep hearing vision yeah. is a word that keeps getting thrown to me. I mean, I know everybody's talking. It's, to, you it, guys it, are talking to different people, but I keep it's hearing It's easy to this. say, well, you know, it's Los Angeles. They were playing against this team. It doesn't matter. I mean, like, if, if you're not making those kind of plays in high school, you're sure not going to make them in college. So, like, when you can make those kind of plays in high school and then be able to translate it, I mean, how good can this kid be? I mean, like, I think everybody was just kind of leery of the size, but I mean, like, he's bigger than you than a lot of people thought he was. Size in school. Yeah. Size in competition play. Yeah, but I mean, like, even like, when you go back a year ago, it literally took CPA pulling a Benny Hammonds and watering their field in the playoffs and making it com a complete quagmire. He still went over 100 yards. But that was the only way they could slow him down enough to win that football game. If it's a dry surface, they repeat. Instead, CPA went on and, you know, to the state title game because they made it a quagmire. I mean, the, the SEC teams can't, you know, no. oops, left the sprinklers <laughs> on. I, I'm not saying like. They did that at Notre Dame for a while, didn't they? And they used to do that. They, they screwed the, the grass out. <laughs> <laughs> they screwed the grass out. <laughs> I, think, I think to your point, I was about vision. This is an off, with, with the continued questions around the offensive line. Tennessee can't afford to just give away three yards. Right. They just can't. And so if, if, if he can if, turn negative two into positive four. Yeah, or if he can get five instead of two. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that, that just makes a world of difference for an offense that, you know, I think is going to have problems at times. It is pretty interesting that, that you know, he, Gray and, and Henry T., now, Gray was here, but he didn't go through spring practice. Henry T. didn't get here till June. 
and not to say the other freshmen are not doing well or whatever, but those are the two guys that are jumping out. And yeah. both of those guys didn't get here until didn't, didn't become a factor till June. Yeah, the only positive for Gray was he mentally got to go he through was, some things. Right. But physically, no. Right. But I mean, you know, I'm sure he learned some things, but I mean, as, and he's pretty mature, but you know, you don't know how much he truly he, took in and soaked in in those 15 days. True. I, he at least is playing a position that if you're lining them up for freshmen, it is one of the easier ones to play. Yeah, but on the flip side, though, with Linebackers Henry, not. with Henry, I mean, it's pretty amazing when a coach says he can make calls. Says the guy, says two things to me. One, the guy's really smart. B, he did a whole lot of work before he got here. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean we laughed about this on the two minute and, and maybe even the other podcast we did on Friday, but I mean, Pruitt couches everything he says, specifically about young players. There's always a but or an and or a, well, they got to do this. You go back and read those Henry comments, there's none of that. Same thing it's about just Eric all Gray. effusive praise. Yeah. Same thing with Greg. He praised his maturity and everything else. I mean, it's – and it's – Use the word vision just like you did. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because you wonder, is that a little bit because he knows he's got to have them and so he's trying to continue to build some confidence there? Or is that, you know, just raw? Hey, this is where it's at. I think I think it's raw, personally. I mean, just from dealing with Jeremy, I don't think that he's. You don't think it's a calculated I, I build build somebody up type deal? I don't deal? think so. No, I mean, I that's not his wrong. nature. I I, don't, I just don't think that's in him. At least at this point in his coaching career. Well, it certainly doesn't sound. I mean, I do think he's gotten better about. I mean, like you ain't got to like throw a ton of praise, but you also don't have to say oh, we got guys in the room. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, he, I think he has he just gotten naturally class. better with, with, with those kind of situations. Well, I, I would agree with that. But I will say this. His comments, based on everybody we talked to, translated to being accurate and what they got done in the scrimmage. I mean, the praise for Henry T. pre-scrimmage, nobody was saying he was a fish out of water last night. You know, this morning when you talk to people, nobody was going, well, he's not quite ready there. No, instead the hype train's on, uh, <laughs> the, the bus is moving for both of those boys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, 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 yeah, I mean, there's some things that, that I'm sure that, that both of them have to work on. But, you know, for two guys that Pruitt praised, they both backed up that praise with production um, on, uh, on uh, Sunday in the scrimmage. Uh, staying on the defensive side, interesting in the secondary – Schamberger, that's a star, you know, uh, looks, I'm not saying he's won that job, but he's getting a long, long look at that and a lot of opportunities there. And then you get the Warren Burrell deal. Um, l- looks like he's going to be their third corner, would, would be a, certainly would be in the rabbits and the dime package for sure, and, and we'll see from there. But because of Alante being nicked up a little bit, ton of work for Warren Burrell. And I think he's really pushing Alante. I mean, I do talk, talking to some folks. I mean, I, you know, if I mean, if, the, if hypothetically the season started tomorrow, I, I would not be surprised if, if or I would not be shocked if Warren got the start. Now, Alante has three weeks, you know, to kind of continue to ramp up his efforts and, and get back healthy. Um, I mean, that's another, we haven't even mentioned this, but that's another overarching theme from the scrimmage. You, Alabama, USC, some of these teams have all had major injuries, you know, in their first scrimmage. From everything we've heard, Tennessee walked out healthy, which, I mean, that's a big deal this time in fall camp. Yeah, I mean, throw some salt over your shoulder or whatever. I mean, but no, I they mean, just got their player hurt in the <laughs> regular drill. They did, but, I mean, that's, you know, it, one player, you know, again, a lot, of, a lot of teams are losing a lot of guys, so. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's the one thing you want to hear. And certainly I mean, this is mostly a healthy weekend. football team right now. Well, and it yeah. has been since Jeremy got here. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know if that's, you know, What's well, the way they practice? It's the way the way, they, the way they you know the the off season strength and conditioning well, stuff. And I think there's also a little bit of a mentality deal. Are you are you are you tough enough? Are you hurt? Ter- are you hurt or are you injured? And I think there's a little bit more of some guys being forced yeah. and, and being pushed to push through some some yeah. bumps I and bruises. I agree with that. But also, I mean, the just the rash of off season shoulder, shoulder surgeries. Has, I mean, I, I don't know if that's. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, I don't know. The unneeded which, surgery? I mean, well, well, I don't know about I mean, unneeded, but I mean, needed, but I don't, and I don't know what caused it. I don't know if it's a fluke or whatever, but that's, I mean, that's not been the case. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean that there's was, some years where Tennessee had as many as 20 off-season surgeries. You know, that's, that's not been, that's not the case at this point in time. Um, so, back, back in the secondary a little bit, what, what, what do you make of, I mean, I know that, that they made a couple of plays, but it sounds like the, the defense got the stops when they got in, you know, into the 
kind of the scoring area, maybe not the red zone, but got down into that area. What what do you make of the secondary right now, overall? I'm intrigued about Jesse's note about Shamberger getting most of the run with. The, I mean that that was the most interesting aspect of the secondary chatter. I thought him. But mostly likely because Alante is nicked up. You think that causes a shuffle? Yes, in my opinion. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think I, I think a lot. I, I I think I don't. I mean, I don't. From what we've heard, I think Tennessee is is interested in getting Alante looks at the star. But I mean, we've seen Schamberger out there all week at practice. You know, with the at that spot, and then for him to 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 continue to get that work um, in the scrimmage. I mean, he's a guy that has talent. He's a guy that has tools. He's, he's just they've it's been pulling teeth with him in for just, terms of attitude Jeremy, and effort yeah, at he's times. He's been Jeremy's doghouse. You uh, wonder if a, if a kind of a change of scenery with with Derek Hansley coming back there has been has been good for him. It's kind of been yeah. a wake up call for him. Yeah, and he also and and you know again year two he did play some in the nickel a year ago, so there is some familiarity there uh, in in terms of expectations, calls that 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 kind of stuff. So, you know, we'll see. There's a couple, there's, you know, this next, if he's, if he's running at the same spot again a week from now, I think that's, that, I think that's going to say a lot. Yeah, you, you, you do wonder, like, if, if, you know, you know, it's like when you have a, a really stern parent and then, you know, the, you, you enter a new, you know, the, maybe they get, I don't know, this is a long roundabout way, but you, basically you go to, you have a buffer parent. Maybe Ansley's kind of like the buffer parent between Schamberger and Pruitt. You know, somebody that Schamberger can go to, Talk through things with without you know, well you and, know what I'm saying. And maybe Ans maybe Ansley has told Jeremy Pruitt, hey, let me wipe the slate slate clean with him. You know, whereas I mean, well, it's not, it, I'm not saying I'm not saying Jeremy was in the wrong and having Schamberger in the doghouse. No, but it's his job to bit bring the as much as it is Schamberger to bring his own effort. It's also on the coaches to get that potential out of them. Right, and so may, maybe maybe Ansley is saying, hey, you know. Maybe that's helped to, to your point as well, and and being the. Well, it's not, like as a parent, you have, you know sometimes you pick your battles. You know, my six year old wants to wear red socks with, you know, green shoes. You just sometimes let it roll. You know? That's what you're wearing today, right? No nope. flip flops, <laughs> and a master's pull up. <laughs> stunned, everyone's stunned. Um, I, I mentioned this in the three, two, one. I think Roman Harrison's the, the, the going to be the buzz guy this week. I think that's the guy. Not that he's going to start, but I think that's the guy people are going to be talking about because of the effort that he plays with and Tennessee's quest to try to find somebody opposite, you know, of, of Daryl Taylor to get to the quarterback. He so is I'm, I'm going to go Roman Harris. He is a grade aid guy that's going to get thrown out for spirit <laughs> on a special team. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he, I mean, he <laughs> plays everything we've heard. He plays I mean, that guy's just going to knock that. He's going to go down and drop knock, kick somebody. He's just <laughs> knock the piss out of somebody on a kickoff <laughs> return team. Uh, Targeting <laughs> thirty orange. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna see uh, Byron walking him into the locker room. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, Hubs is right. I mean, like he just he brings a tenacity and physicality that is much needed on this roster. Uh, you got to be careful with that at times, obviously. But I mean, if they can figure out a way to use him in sub packages as a pass rusher, you know, I, he's not a guy that's that's ready to be an every down guy yet at that jack spot. Um, but they're looking for help, you know, opposite of Taylor, and, and he's an option potentially. Yeah, he was a guy that I don't. He did not. He was not a standout by any means in the in the Sunday scrimmage. But again, you just talk to people, and you know, it's like it's there. He just doesn't know what to do with it because he's never been, never played that position, never been a pass rush. But he did, it did flash a couple of times with some pressures on the quarterback. And 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 one of the words on Crouch was is that they used him with his hand in the ground. As kind of a defensive end more, which, you know, I mean, he's a big boy. I, I would not be surprised if Crouch's weight on the listed roster is 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 a tad, tad low. Yeah, and I would like to see where he is, his strength numbers are compared to the rest of this team too. Pound for pound, I bet he's one of the strongest guys. As a freshman, he's one of the strongest guys of anybody on the roster. When, when it's all said and done. We'll see it. All right, let's flip it over to the offense. We talked a little bit about Eric Gray, obviously. Everyone, Rob, expected DWA Dominic Wood Anderson. Yeah. They expect him to make plays. He's, I mean, he looks the part. Jim Cheney's got to like what he's got there. Sounds like Tennessee found him on Sunday. Not a surprise to anybody <coughs> that, that he's a part of the playmaker package, yeah, if you will. I don't think so at all. I mean, and we probably all expected a little too much last year. But, I mean, this, I mean he just looked the part from the day he got here. I mean, I, I, I understand that, you know, actually, you know, he played flexed out, almost kind of a wide receiver in, in junior college. But 
man, I mean, you don't have to – he's one of the guys like, you know, Middleton on defense. I mean, DWA just jumps out at you on offense when you're talking about, you know, looking at a guy with physical tools. You walk over to the tight end group and look and – it's I mean it's night and day. You yeah. see him. You see there's Jacob Warren and, and the two and the freshman you know Low and and Sean Brown. I mean he just looks different. I mean he's a different kind of cat. And I mean it's it is I could be I couldn't be less surprised to hear that you know Jim Chaney found a way to get him the football. I, I imagine he's going to be a big part of a lot. I mean if you're looking for mismatches and you know to get get your playmakers the ball, which is what Jim Chaney has a reputation of doing. And I mean I think all that spells. A big season for DWA. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100. percent Austin, I always love coaches talking about going into scrimmage. Well, we're gonna keep it simple. We're gonna do all this, that. Then you talk to people afterwards, and it's like, yeah, the offense threw about every formation under the sun. You know, at the defense. I mean, it, it gets into those things with coaches, and they just it becomes playing ball. Uh, it sounds like offensively, it's not it's not just getting the ball to the playmakers, but one of the things Jim Chaney's doing a lot with this offense to try to create defensive confusion and mask some of their shortcomings. It's just a lot of different formations, shifts, motions, all that type of stuff to, to try to, you know, give give defense issues. And it sounds like that's what they did on Sunday as the, well. Their version of slide of hand, you know. Yeah, and, and a bit. just kind of misdirection and, you know, just basically do it do just enough to have the defense's head spinning to help you catch somebody napping a little bit yeah. and so I mean I, you know Jim Chaney's going to get you know his best players the ball and he, I don't think he's ever going to just like live and die trying to force feed one or two players the ball he's going to find ways and, and different ways to to use guys and I think the more kind of utility type players that you can get DWA being able to split them out and not just have him put his hand on the ground Eric Gray and Ty Chandler putting them in the slot doing all those types of things I think uh, just uh, gives Jim Chaney more tools, and when Jim Chaney has tools, he's proven over time he's really, really good. I, I, and I think that's what he's, like you said, given some tools and weapons, he's going to create some some mismatches with certain guys, and I think he, that's what the focus has been to this point. All right, Tennessee's got a second major scrimmage this week. What, what do you expect out of the offensive line? Okay, we, we got you know Wanye Morris working at left tackle. Is, but also works on the left guard. Yeah, is, is I mean, I guess the, the the biggest elephant in the room first of all is Trey Smith. Do we think? I mean, if you're Tennessee, do you do you scrimmage Trey Smith in in, in week two and and kind of see how his body reacts to things? Or are you going to play it like you did last year and just you know, hey, we'll go out there and see what he does first game and how his body reacts to everything first game? See, I just would be shocked. I mean, the kid's not had a live rep since last was it October. I mean, I just can't see them just, you know, letting him play patty cake on the sidelines and then throwing him out there against Georgia State. Not that, you know, there's some real threat, but, I mean, it's still live football, August 31st, <coughs> a real game. I think at some point you're, you're barking him in. So I would venture to say he does probably try to scrimmage next Saturday. That's, that's, my, that's my gut, having talked to some people, was, you know, Tennessee's got a plan in place, even though as much as they don't want to talk about it, you know, to the media. There's a plan in place for, for Trey Smith to play, um, and I think it starts by, you know, slowly working him in over the course of Paul Camp. We saw him do more as the week progressed this week. Didn't expect him to scrimmage, Jesse. How much more do you take him if you're Tennessee? I'm in agreement with Austin. I think you at least have to see it. Now, you know, perhaps they don't scrimmage him, but he starts to get 11 on 11 work the week of game week, you know, that, 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 that Tuesday, Wednesday, when they kind of ramp up schematically and do some of that stuff. But I mean, he's not coming over some normal – he's not overcoming some normal injury. Like where you're like, well, we can hold him out and we'll just put him out there. I yeah. Mean, I mean, that blood clots in his lungs. I mean, at some point you have to me, don't you have to, like, see it a little bit? I would have to think that you – I for sure – I mean, not to, to see him play, but, I mean, see – Because you can control the scrimmage. Like, you can't control Saturdays. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you can – you know, you're six feet away in a scrimmage at times as a coach. In and in a live game, I mean – I just wonder if they don't go full-scale scrimmage, but as Jesse's saying, and we saw this when, when we left the practice field on Saturday. Now, they were in shells. It wasn't full contact, but he was in an 11-on-11 11 11 setting, which was the first time we had seen it. Granted, we had not seen every 11-on-11 11 11 setting, so he may have right. done more of that for. But with shoulder pads on, he was lined up as the first team left guard in a, in a period that featured 11 players going against 11 players. I wonder if they get him some nine on nine on eight type work, 
some physical work and small dosages on the practice field and not do the full not do a full scrimmage but do you put him out there and get him 15 scrimmage snaps in the stadium and get get him lathered up pretty good and see how his body works that makes a lot of sense too yeah and this goes back to the article I wrote a week ago you know it's that it's that kind of comp- continuity versus competition and, and the whole balance that Cheney is kind of having to to deal with there because with the continued uncertainty with Trey, it, it's just impossible for Tennessee to work the same five guys together, which proved problematic a year ago from both just a talent level, but also just communication <laughs> standpoint. We know, Rob, they're rotating a bunch of guys at right guard. You know, Calvert kind of seems like he may be in the doghouse this week. Can he bounce back? Because it was, you know, Carvin and, and, and Locklear getting more run there after the Calvert. The Locklear thing really caught me off guard. So, I mean, but they're moving guys around. And, you know, Carvin got some work with the twos at center. So, I mean, as, you know, Jeremy said, they got, they, I think they have, you know, nine or ten guys that they're, they're, they're working there. But at some point, you have to settle on five. Yeah. Do, they, do they settle on that this week going into scrimmage? Or do you think they let it play out another week? I mean, I, I, I don't think you can overstate, and this is hardly an original thought, but I just don't think you can overstate how important continuity is up there to get five guys working together, which, I mean, as Jesse Especially when out, you have the Trey situation, yeah. so you know he's not, you know. But it may run hand in hand. They may say if they may say we're not going to put five together until we know that Trey's going to be out there. And yeah, and that, that's, that's, I mean, a, they may that's say, the wild card. I mean, it's impossible to put your best five out there until you know what's up with Trey. Well, and let's, let's look at the left side, for example, because that's where Trey would play if he's there. If he's not there, then is are you better with – Wanye inside at guard and Jameer Johnson at left tackle. Are you better with, with Wanye out at left tackle, Jameer Johnson at guard? Are you better with Wanye at tackle and somebody else at left guard? You know, I think those are the things you're trying to find an answer to. Um, you know, and, and I don't want to say Jameer Johnson's the odd man out, but it, it feels like right now he's, he's a little bit down the ladder to me with where is that now. He doesn't look like he looks like he weighs 255 pounds again, 260 pounds, and just compared, you know, him standing next to everybody else, he's as lean as lean can be. Um, so, I mean, the the, que- the question is, in Jim Chaney's world, is he physical enough for him? You know, where does he factor in? But they like the irony is, is that he was small a year ago, and they thought he was their most, you know, tenacious line because of his mentality and the way um, he had, and the way he had it. But on and the he's right, gonna, he's going to be, he, and and he's going to be pretty. P.O.'d AP if he's not in the starting five. We saw him slam his helmet at practice the other day. And that wasn't about that. That was just about other stuff. No, so, I, mean, I know. But I'm just saying, like, he, he's a guy that – Because you know, of the mentality, he runs a little hot yeah. at times. Yeah, he's I an agree. emotional I, guy. He's an emotional I, I, guy. I, I agree. I think that he could end up, you know, being – I won't say an issue, but I, I, I do think that, you know, it, it could be an, an issue, not him an issue, but, like, the situation um, – you know, if if he's not in the five, if I'll say this, we, we we all we all believe right now as of today that that Trey is on track to play. Agreed. But if but if 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 hypothetically if he that doesn't happen, I think the offensive line, much like the backup quarterback deal, potentially like the star spot, could be a thing that basically in those first three games. Now it's going to be challenging for BYU because it's you know, the, the competition ramps up. But specifically against Georgia State and Chattanooga, I think they're gonna, I think they would play a ton of combinations. Yeah, would make sense. Feels like right now Marcus Tatum has a has a pretty sizable lead to be the right tackle over over Darnell Wright. Not because of physical ability, just because of where he's at and understanding the offense versus where Darnell. Yeah, is if at. Darnell had been here, uh, mid you know midterm. Yeah, I I you know and in talking to some people, I do think Darnell regrets the decision not to come early. Yeah, I'm sure he probably does because he. I'm sure he feels like he's playing catch up, and, yep. and you know that's a hard thing to do though. I mean, you go miss out on a lot of things your senior year of high school. You know, hindsight's always twenty twenty on that deal. But because he of that, he's and, and because Tatum's added the weight and some of the strength levels he's added to, he's gonna. It looks like he's holding. He's holding his own at right tackle right now. Yeah, and, and I mean for Darnell again, the physical gifts are limitless, but. How many how many actual pass sets has he taken in his you know in his life? It's not that many. I mean, he got he got as much work down at the Under Armour game doing that stuff than he did at you know four years at Huntington. Yeah, it's so, just not the way they play. No, I mean, they weren't and dropping so, back, throwing it twenty times. So that you know that, that that's that's been an, an adjustment here. Whereas Wanye played in a more 
you know, the Grayson had a bunch of college dudes. They were throwing, they were throwing the pill around, and he had more experience there. Plus, the fifteen practices of, uh, of enrolling early, and plus the level of competition he played against. Yeah, night and day. Yeah, you know, yeah. compared to the kind of schedule they play at Grayson. Yeah. All right. Final final question here as we as we wrap up this scrimmage recap football edition of the podcast here. As Tennessee goes into this week, heads into another scrimmage coming up this weekend. For for I'll, everybody, jump in here. Biggest question based on everything you feedback you've had from Sunday biggest question biggest thing you're looking to see this week out of this football team it can be an individual it can be a, a an overall philosophy thing B- biggest thing you're looking for this week I mean to me it's just I mean trying to get close to figuring out who your five are on on the offensive line and I don't know the, and, you know again with tra- with the Trey situation I mean that, that adds a degree of difficulty to that that is far from ideal, but and I know Jeremy said they have ten. They feel good about working with or whatever. But I, I think getting because I think continuity is so important up there you know, for the five guys to develop some chemistry. So getting close to that to me is is a big deal. <laughs> I'm just gonna go to see if they have Aubrey Solomon. <coughs> I mean, because I mean, like you, you, you give him all this run and over here in the scrimmage, and and obviously he you know he was pretty solid. So you know it just the more you see him, the more you feel like you need him. The, you know, the, the most important paper document or phone call that, that, that Tennessee's been looking for in a while uh, on the football side of things for sure. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with either one of those things, Jesse. Uh, I'll, I'll, does, does Gray kind of continue his ascension? I'll, 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 I'll go with that because I think that there's opportunity there with Banks a little bit banged up. The fact that, you know, I think Tennessee knows what they can get out of a guy like um, Tim Jordan with the ability and flexibility to kind of move Ty Chandler around. Uh, does Gray continue his ascension or does, you know, a lot of times these things, it, it's not, growth is not linear for the, for a lot of these freshmen. And so it, you know, it would not surprise no one if he had a little bit of a setback this week because maybe he has some issues in pass protection or maybe he fumbles in a scrimmage. So can he kind of continue that early momentum, which I think would afford him uh, some serious playing time early in the season. Yeah, I would agree with that one too. But I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Austin and Aubrey Solomon because that's the guy. You're either gonna have him or you're not gonna have him. And <laughs> if you have him, smart. Yeah. <laughs> if you have him, it's it changes things. If you don't have him, then then you gotta you know manage your rotation. Maybe you do some different things. What with ha- guys. What happens? What happens if we are sitting here a week from today and we still don't know anything? Well, then I think at that point, <laughs> you, I think. I think What's your point, answer? Then? You know, <laughs> Pre- prepare to not. I mean, Aubrey Solomon. <laughs> you know, continue to prepare not to have him. I mean, I think at that, if if you don't have an answer by the end of this week, I think how you approach next weekend scrimmage has to be different than how you approach it this past weekend, because you've got to you've got to get some more you got to get some more run for some guys in there. You know, not that they didn't get some run, but you got to get Elijah Simmons more on there with the first team. You know, you got to get some of these other guys in there in anticipation for not having him. I think so. Vincey becomes. Extremely important yeah. if uh, if middle t- or if uh, if Solomon, Solomon is not eligible. Yeah, you got to get him. And I'm, I'm intrigued sure. by Emerson just because, you know, he did. I mean, he he, he was kind of the forgotten man, you know, out of all this. You know, the the big three defensive line. Well, that's the guy they moved to the offensive line a year ago. Yeah, and he, he wasn't he wasn't athletic enough. And we've all done this long enough to know that rankings, you know, don't mean a lot once they get on campus. But outside of Aubrey Solomon, he's the highest ranked guy as a recruit. You know, on that front, yeah, it certainly is. And he's not, and he's not, you know, talking. I don't think he's going to be like an every down guy, you know, as much as they played Alexis and those guys. But if he's a guy, I think that they hope can really clog up the middle and on early downs give you twenty, you know, quality snaps. Well, they better not be playing any of those guys as many t- snaps as they played those three a year ago because those three ran completely out of gas. By the way, um, good things for the uh, kickers uh, on Saturdays. Yeah, they're Sound drilling like field goals. Had a, uh, had a really good day kicking the football. So uh, we'll dive into more of that. We'll see what Jeremy Pruitt has to say about the scrimmage when he meets the media on Tuesday. My last thing thought, I, would, I, will think, I do think it's kind of funny, and this just kind of shows you where Tennessee's at at the position, but I didn't hear a lot good or bad about the starting quarterback, which is just kind of funny. You know, we've talked for years. It's been like, what did, what did Garrett yeah. Tonner, what did Dormandy, what did, you know, what did, what did, what did Kelly Chris do in the scrimmage? And it was mostly about – 
Mauer and Shrell. Because, because because whether he throws three picks yeah, in the scrimmage exactly. or three touchdowns in the scrimmage, the he, starting quarterback at Tennessee. Exactly. I just thought it was funny because we didn't even name. Yeah. We didn't even mention. Nobody him, so even asked about him yeah, either. You know, like, I know. He's the starter. Whatever yeah. he did is whatever he did. He's the starter quarterback exactly. for sure. That's good to it for this edition of the VolQuest.com podcast for Austin Price, Rob Lewis, and Jesse Simonton. I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Monday, everybody.